First United Methodist Church and the House of the Lord. Uh, please uh, take a look at your bulletin, uh, the announcements in it. I'm going to touch on some of those, but there's a little bit more detail uh, also on a couple of them. Um, it's time to start planning for the new pictorial directory for our families. Uh, we do this uh, every four or five years, and that time frame has already expired. Uh, dates and times, uh, right when you go in the, uh, what I call the, not the educate, Nettie Hammond building, if you go in from this side, not from the street side, where we call the Cynthia Room, there's a table called the Welcome Center. And right there you'll find times and dates for sign-ups. So please do that, uh, and we'll start getting that in order. Vacation Bible School will be Tuesday through Thursday nights, the 25th through the 27th of June, starting at 530 there are classes for people of all ages, and there's a very distinct description in your planning ahead version here. A nursery will be provided. Uh, check the bulletin for registration info or stop in at the church office. Don't forget to pick up your CD for those of you that know you're coming. Sing and play roar CD so that you'll be familiar with the music. Uh, adults are not required to register. Uh, you can just come as you are. And always please remember your support would be greatly appreciated financially and otherwise. There is a list uh, either right beside Tish's door, I think, there in the hallway across from the church office that shows what's needed. And you can check your name off on that list and go purchase that item. Uh, so we'll have that. Children's Council and Vacation Bible School volunteer meetings for today have been canceled. Mary Louise will be in contact with the Vacation Bible School volunteers individually. Also, we still need volunteers to help with setup and cleanup for Vacation Bible School, <clears throat> and as I previously mentioned, some supplies are still needed, uh, so please sign up for those. If you're interested in helping uh, or helping to clean up, please contact Mary Louise. We encourage everyone to sign the pew pads and place them in the collection plates. Visitors, please include a phone number and an address so that we can contact you. Also, please remember our food bank. Donations and volunteers are always needed and appreciated. If you'd like to volunteer, come to the Fellowship Hall this Friday. will be the next one. Well, this Friday, 3 o'clock, to help with the sorting and hanging, excuse me, hanging, sorting and bagging of the food. Uh, we're not serving any jerky, it's mostly cans and some meat, so we won't, but the bagging and sorting, and then Saturday morning at 8.45, uh, come and the distribution starts at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. June the 30th is our fifth Sunday celebration. There will be a combined service at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Fifth Sunday will be June the 30th, combined service, 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary, followed by a covered dish luncheon in the fellowship hall. Uh, please mark your calendars and plan to join us for this time of food and fellowship. The church will provide fried chicken, rolls, tea, and lemonade. Bless you. I have a brief, brief mission moment. One is, don't forget your pennies to go in here. I hope I can't lift it sometime when I come in here. This is for the Adopt an Inmate program. There are several of these around the building. Be sure and put your pennies in it. Um, in the pew pockets 
are envelopes. One's for the food bank. Most anybody could put a dollar in that. We'd appreciate it. One is for adopt an inmate. If they are not in there, take one of these blank ones and write across the back, food bank or adopt an inmate. Put your dollar in there. We can use any money for any of these. And he was saying volunteers for the food bank on Tuesday evening. <laughs> some of us are gonna get together about 2.15ish. We've got 100 pounds of rice and 100 pounds of dried beans. We need to sort into smaller bags. We can use any help we can get. Meet us in the fellowship hall. Thank you. Now let us turn our hearts toward worshiping God. As you're able, would you please stand and join me in the call to worship that is printed in your bulletin. 
The Spirit of Truth is moving. The Spirit of Truth is speaking. The Spirit of Truth is with us. Would you please join me in the unison opening prayer that is printed in your bulletin. Spirit of truth, pour out your presence on us. Cause wonders to occur as we dream your dreams and see your visions. Create unity and weave us together as one body of Christ, one family of God, and one community of justice and peace. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I have an opportunity to take about five minutes to say thanks. Um, this is thanks from the team at Growing Change, and five minutes would not be enough. So today I am here giving you some updates and some good news coming from our work in Wagram. So as many of you know, we are the team that's out in Wagram at the old field camp prison. And we're converting that prison into a sustainable farm and an educational center in order to serve as a national model for how closed prisons throughout the U.S. can be used in a way that helps keep young people out of prison, helps serve the community, helps raise food, helps to celebrate uh, these rural communities that have carried the burden of these prisons for a long time. Now, I was joking with the Shelley family this morning at Morning Church that if you judged our very modest farming operations, well, our margins would be a little thin right now. But we are growing some amazing, amazing opportunities. 
So one of our young men, Jaheem McRae, uh, just received a full ride to Elon University as a junior in high school, wrapped around a major internship as well. We had a young man who flew back on a five-day furlough from U.S. Army Airborne from northern Italy to get married to his high school sweetheart as she is entering basic training in two weeks so that they'll be able to be stationed together. Over our five-year longitudinal period, when we first began, working with young people that were kicked out of home, kicked out of school, and put on probation at a young age, we were 92% effective in preventing these young men from going into the adult correctional system. Now that makes a lot of sense, and it saves a lot of money. This is only possible because of a huge team that has partnered with us, nine different universities ranging from St. Andrews to UNCP to our land-grant universities, even up to MIT, who will be back again in August to help us with an intentional build in the middle of the site. We have thanks to the Rotary Club, we have access to a deep well to provide agricultural irrigation as well as some production. And by the fall, we'll be, well, Lord willing in the creek don't rise, literally. By the fall, we will be uh, jarring and selling our own chow chow recipe. We'll be bagging our own soil amendments for production because our intention is to create the part-time and full-time jobs to help young people coming out of extreme challenges succeed and plug back into the community in a, in a productive way. That transformation has been made possible by many people in this church and by the grace of God that goes before us. I mean, y'all reflect on this for just a minute. This crazy band from Scotland County, Robinson County, Hope County, that had bonded together, many of the young people that have come from extreme challenges, now lifting up a national model that with the support of the Kellogg Foundation in a year and a half, will create the prison flip toolkit and will be given to the 300 communities in the United States trying to figure out what to do with closed prisons. That is only made possible by God's grace. <laughs> you can't explain this based on the odds. So we appreciate being a poster child of grace and look forward to being able to come back to you with future updates. I wanna say a special thanks to you because with the financial support we are expanding our sheep flock in Wagram. I do believe we have the safest sheep flock in North Carolina as we have 15 foot fence with razor wire around top of it. <laughs> that sheep flock will be used for rotational grazing outside as we transform a prison perimeter into pasture to lift up a national example of what ought to be done with these abandoned public properties. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Norm, for your, your great leadership and vision for that. And uh, God, is, God is using his gifts to transform and change communities. And that's what God wants to do with all of us. Uh, he gave him a gift, and uh, now he's using that gift, and God is using it in a mighty, mighty way. And so that should serve as an example for us. When you use what God has given you, things happen, things change. And so this morning we turn our hearts and our minds now to uh, those who are going through uh, things in their lives. And let us continue to remember all of those who are on our prayer list, but especially uh, Sister Peggy and Dr. Anna Duncan. Um, Dr. Anna, she's... Um, she's um, um, uh, she attends the early service, and um, she had surgery um, about about four weeks ago uh, on her back, and um, and so something that they fixed there, it it just it was a catalyst for something else, and so she just went through another major surgery, uh, and hopefully she'll be home Tuesday. 
Uh, but let's be much in prayer for her and also Sue Jones and Trinity Key. Uh, be much in prayer for all of them. Let us remember those families of uh, <clears throat> the accident victims last night. I um, understand that a person was killed here in our community. Uh, and so let's be much in, be much in prayer uh, for them. Are there any other concerns or maybe words of praise that you'd like to share with the church at this time? If there are no others, reach to your right and to your left and take hold of someone's hand and let us go to the Lord united and in one accord. Eternal Father, creator of heaven and earth, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the great I am, the chief physician, the almighty, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, but most of all, our Emmanuel, God who is with us. God, we steal our hearts this morning out of praise and adoration to you. God, you're the only one who is worthy of our praise this morning. And God, we're here to worship for an audience of one. God, beside you, there is no other. You're the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Father, on this day, 2,000 years ago, you birthed your church and what we call Pentecost Sunday. But God, it was a day in which heaven and earth collided. Lives were transformed and changed. The culture that existed around the church was changed, transformed, ratified because of the power of He, the Holy Spirit, who invaded our lives to guide us into all spiritual truth. And so, God, we just pray this morning, Lord, that by the same power that existed on that day of Pentecost that calls your children to begin to speak in tongues, speak in other languages, in a language that people that were around them were able to hear the gospel proclaimed in their own tongue, their own voice, their own language. God, I pray and ask, Lord, the same power that brought healing and wholeness now that, that resides in our hearts and our lives, God will transform us. That the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us, Lord, that, that we would understand, Lord, that we're still living within the power on that first day of Pentecost. And so, God, we pray for these concerns that have been voiced those that were unvoiced, those that were on our prayer list, we pray for them, Lord, asking God that you would bless and that you would touch according to your will and your purpose. But I pray and ask especially, Lord, that you would change our hearts. God, help us this morning that as we open our hearts to you and worship you, help us, Father, to stop living on the low expectations and start living, Father, in a life of expectancy. God, that we expect your son Jesus to move in our lives through and by the spirit that he has given unto us. 
And so God, transform and change, Lord, and we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And now, Father, we want to pray the prayer of faith that your son Jesus taught us to pray. And he said, whenever you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us lift our offering. Giver of life, giver of grace, giver of peace and wholeness. God, you're the giver of all the good things in life. And so now, God, as we give back a small portion of the blessings that you have poured out on our lives, we pray and ask God that you would bless it, anoint it, and use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Help us to be the stewards, God, that you've called us to be, to reach the least, the last, and the lost. And God will honor you and praise you. In the name of the Christ, we do pray, pray, and let all of God's people say, Amen.
morning, girls. And Philip, how are you? All right. So I'm going to ask you a question. What do you want to be when you grow up? Anybody got any, any ideas what you want to be? Ooh, a veterinarian. That's a great one, a veterinarian. Anybody else? Jesse, what do you want to be? An artist. That's a great thing to be. Well, let me ask you a question. Who gets to tell you what you're going to be? Some, some big person out there going to say, Philip, you've got to be a truck driver. No, no. You get to make your own decisions, right? You grow up, you're going to make your own decisions on what you're going to be, okay? To remember that for one second. Does anybody know what today is? What's so special about this Sunday? All right? Let me tell you. It's called Pentecost, all right? Pentecost. Y'all see the red they have here, and Pastor Terry's got red on, and everyone up there? All right? It's a special day for Pentecost. Now, Pentecost is a big word, but it's kind of simple, all right? Here's what Pentecost is. It's the day we remember when the Holy Spirit came down to earth to be with everybody, right? So in the scripture, what Pastor Terry was going to tell everybody is the story where the disciples are together and they're all gathered together during the time of Pentecost, right? And a mighty wind comes down. It must have sounded like a tornado or a freight train. This mighty wind, you could hear it, right? And it came down on all of the disciples that were gathered together. And what was amazing was they had all people from all different lands, 10, 20 different countries all around with 20 different languages. It'd be like today, people all gathered together. Some people spoke Spanish or some people spoke Portuguese or French or English, all of them, right? But the amazing thing was when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they went out and started talking to everyone, everybody knew what they were saying. So if you were speaking Spanish, you understood what I was saying if I was speaking in English. Or if you were speaking in Portuguese, you knew what I was saying if I was speaking in Swahili, right? So when the Holy Spirit came down, it made it possible for them to go out and speak and spread his word, which was important, right? Because they were all tasked at that moment when the Holy Spirit came to them that they were to go out and spread God's word to all the lands, right? But they had to have the special gift so that everybody knew what they were saying, right? Now, Meyer, what would you think if we told you, all right, Meyer, it's time for you to go to China and you got to go talk about Jesus. Would you be worried about doing that? Do you think you could do it? So, 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 I bet so. Well, guys, I would imagine that all of his disciples were kind of so-so about it as well, right? They were, had to have been a little bit concerned. Here they are having to go out to this whole new land and go somewhere completely different and try to spread God's word, right? But just like those times when the Holy Spirit came, they had faith that the Holy Spirit would be with them the entire time, Right? They expected God to provide them and help them to go through the rest of their life and spread his word. So going back to how you guys and what you're going to be when you grow up, it doesn't matter what you do, right? No matter which where your paths go, just know that as long as you believe in Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, that you're going to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And guys, it's okay to have expectations, right? It's okay if you're a Christian to expect the Holy Spirit to be with you no matter where you go, no matter what obstacles you run into or any fears you may have. Know the same way that the disciples knew that Jesus was going to be with them no matter where they went, no matter where your days go, just know and expect that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will be with you to take you and guide you through wherever you go, all right? All right, everyone, let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you that when you ascended into heaven, Lord, that you brought the Holy Spirit to dwell in and with us, Lord, to be our constant path and our reminder and our help through all situations. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful kids. We thank you for their lives they're going to be leading in the future and may through all trials, tribulations, and celebrations, Lord, that they know and trust that you're going to be there with them no matter what. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.
Sam, you can come on and just finish, finish it up up here uh, this morning. Great job, great job to convey the importance of the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit means. But if God will allow me, I want to share with you just briefly about what God has laid upon my heart. And God has given me this topic of when heaven and earth collide, when heaven and earth merged and came together. And so out of the reverence of the reading of God's word, if you will, stand with me around the building. Not out of reverence to me. I'm a nobody serving somebody but out of the reverence of an almighty and a true and loving and living God. On the birthday of the church, as the scripture says that um, the day of Pentecost, when all were together in one place, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native tongue or language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pomphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Seren, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they're filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall not turn, shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the word of God for we the people of God. You may be seated. When heaven and earth collide. You see in the book of Luke, the first writing of what I think is a continuation into the book of Acts, Luke says this, that the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. In an essence, what Luke is saying is that that Jesus Christ came to bring king, the kingdom of God here on earth. And Jesus illustrates this with his life. And so Jesus, during this time, he brought heaven and it collided with earth. You see, the point of the gospel story as Luke has told it in his first volume 
is that Jesus had come to bring the life of heaven and earth together. That is the meaning of the, the phrase, the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come, he taught us to pray, on earth as it is in heaven. The disciples, we may presume, had been praying that prayer, among others, in the 50 days since Easter. And now the prayer is answered, like so many answered prayers, answered not in the way that they might have imagined, but in the much greater way, which takes up their prayers and welds them into a new reality, the reality God intended all along. And so in an essence, Jesus Christ came to bring heaven to earth. And sometimes in our lives, we have to understand that this is what Jesus came to do. And so the point of Pentecost is that it's the point at which two worlds collide and look like they're going, now going to be together for keeps. The two worlds are, of course, heaven and earth. And in the first century, as the 21st, many people suppose that these two worlds were supposed to stay firmly or separately apart. We live on earth, and God lives in heaven. We hope that there would be some commerce between the two. But sometimes we want to think that earth is where we're at, and heaven is where God is at. And so sometimes we think that those two worlds are separated. But you see, Jesus Christ came to bring heaven and earth together. And so heaven and earth collided whenever Jesus Christ came into the world, but more so whenever Jesus ascended and went back to be with the Father ten days before the day of Pentecost, ten days before they were uh, in that upper room. But I want to... I'm going to ask you something. Now, when heaven and earth collided in the first church, the apostolic church, you see, God used the Holy Spirit to turn the world upside down. God used the Holy Spirit to transform and to change the community around the church. But you see, so often we live on low expectations. We're not expecting God to do much in our lives. But I want us to ask this question. What happens when we allow heaven and earth to collide in our lives? What happens when we have the understanding that, that God in heaven also resides on the inside of our lives? Our worlds are so intertwined and intermingled. You see, it's just like children. You know, I used this illustration this morning. Sometimes children live in two different worlds. They have this understanding. They have their world at home to where um, um, uh, their, their manners and the things in which they say, the way that they talk is it's one thing in the home. And then they have to go to school. And so it's a different world there. It's a different world in which they exist. And so their, their, their mannerisms, their conversations, their etiquette, it all changes whenever they're around. But yet and still, what happens when those two worlds collide? And as I was thinking about this, I remembered a story that one of our preachers told us during our revival. And it went something like this. A young man had accepted Christ and he became a Christian one night at a community revival. He found a church to attend and began reading the Bible, beginning with the gospel and then continuing on through the book of Acts. This young man was excited about what he was reading and wished to see the things that were happening in the book of Acts in the early church. He was looking for them to manif be manifested in himself and in this church that was around him. But sadly, he became disillusioned. Because every Sunday he listened to the liturgy and the sermon was always a three-point sermon and a prayer. And the neat and tidy service always ended right on time at 12 o'clock. And then one day he asked some folks that were around him, he said, when are you going to do the stuff? When are you going to do the stuff? And they started asking him, what stuff? And he said, you know, the stuff. You see, 
He had been reading about the conversions, the healings, the deliverance, and other miracles that took place in the early church that were recorded in the book of Acts. But he wasn't seeing any signs and wonders. As a matter of fact, he really didn't see or feel anything. And he began to wonder, is this all that it is? Where is the excitement? Where is the fire? Where is the passion and the zeal? Folks, now some of you know and you understand. I'm going to get a little Pentecostal here now, but some of you understand that whenever you go to ball games, you can't contain yourself. Somebody, if, you, if somebody tells you to sit down, you'll want to fight them because you're going to cheer for your team. You're going to cheer them on. But yet and still, oftentimes when we come into the house of the Lord, it's like you sit down when you come in, polite and adequate, and say, move me, preacher. Just move me if you can. Go ahead. I dare you. You see, sometimes that's the way we, we think and we feel about church. So where's the passion? You see, sometimes I wonder the same thing. Has our fire been extinguished? Have we become so worried about what other people might say or think that we have quenched the Holy Spirit in our lives? If so, we need to reignite that flame. We need to pray and seek out a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit and catch the world on fire. So what's the difference today? What's the difference today than when the first church, the apostolic church? You see, in the book of Acts, we see that signs and miracles were expected. But in today's world, it seems that we show up and expect the same old, same old. And we don't anticipate for God to move at all in our lives. Sometimes we want to come and we want to say, okay, what's the preacher going to say today? But as um, um, uh, soon as we leave, we're going to go and we're going to do this and we're going to do that and we're going to do that. You've got your schedule all planned out, never expecting God to move or to do something. Never expecting a revival to break out in the life of the church and the church would continue on for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. Never expecting that. We've always got our own agendas. But church, we need to realize that God is still the same today as He was yesterday. And the Holy Spirit should still be moving in the church today. The Holy Spirit should still be moving in our lives. We should be expecting the Holy Spirit to move us for God to show up and to show out in our lives. We need to be spirit-filled. We need to be expecting a change in our lives. We need to be expecting and seeing change in the life of our church. If we would just open up to the Holy Spirit and let Him fill us and begin to operate under the power that He gives us, we would see these things happening. We would see people being drawn to repentance. People being healed spiritually, physically, and emotionally. We would see lives changed and love abound. We would see a revival like we've never seen before. We would see heaven and earth collide. You see, we need to experience the unity of the Spirit as the early church did. We need to be living in genuine love with each other and we need to have the fire fall and the people of God to rise up. But I'm reminded of the infamous words that came out of the Apollo astronaut or Houston, we have a problem. It seems that all over the world we fail to reach our ignition point and the flame doesn't ignite and we continue trying to do things our own way and under our own power because that's the way that we have always done it. I despise those words. I'm just going to be honest with you. That's the way we've always done it. It's just like there's no other way. That's the only way that there is to do it. Listen, it's time for a change. 
It's time for a change. It's time for us to wake up and let the Holy Spirit of God move in our lives. Folks, we need to change our mindset. We need to get out of that rut that is the, always the way that we've done it. But the only way to do that is let the Holy Spirit of God take control of our lives. The same Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost is poured out for us. You see, a lot of times we look and we say that we don't see miracles, we don't see signs, we don't see all of these things happening. Guess what? It's because we're not doing them. We're not letting the Holy Spirit have control of our lives because the same Holy Spirit then is the same Holy Spirit today. It's because we're not expecting God to do anything. Let me ask you a question. When you left home this morning, were you expecting God to do something in your life this morning? Be honest with yourself. It's okay to tell the truth in the church. Be honest with yourself. Were you expecting God to do something or had you already made your other plans that whenever you were going to, well, I'm started meddling now. But we have a problem. Because, listen, in Joel 2 and 28 and 29, we are told this, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. When is the last time that you've ever dreamed a dream for God? When is the last time that God ever gave you a vision, something that you would use for the upbuilding of God's kingdom? When was the last time that God actually spoke to you? You know, I had a person one time, and I was talking to them about how, how God speaks to us, and they said, well, God's never spoken to me. You know my first question to them? Well, have you ever spoken to him? God's not a stuck-up God. If you speak to him, God will speak with you. But brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is ours. It's a gift. Acts 2, 38 and 39 tells us to repent and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who were afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. We all got it. We just re need to reach the ignition point and catch on fire. We all have the same Holy Spirit moving through our lives. We just need to let the Holy Spirit take control of us. When we reach our ignition point and the Spirit lights up, our things start to happen. Barriers are broken. Relationships are reconciled. Disease is cured. Addiction is broken. Hope is established. People are blessed. And guess what, folks? Church happens. Church happens. It breaks out. You see, the Spirit of God is present in our lives, so we need to be expecting something every single day. But oftentimes we live lives of low expectation. We live lives that are saying, I'm not expecting God to do anything in my life. You see, we can reach our ignition point and catch fire if we would just realize a couple of things. First, we need to realize that the Christian life isn't about keeping rules. It's about knowing Christ. You see, churches all over the world today are filled with people decked out in their Sunday best. The preacher is saying all the right things and everyone is right on cue with the responsive readings. But where is the passion? Where is the zeal? I've been there and I've been in services where no one sang out loud. No one clapped their hands. And heaven forbid if somebody would raise their hands or say amen. They would get run out of the church. But folks, when did church become a place for silent worship? Where has the excitement of the early church gone? Where has it gone? When we were told that, when were we told that if we love God, we need to keep it silent and don't talk about it? Where is that? I've read the book, as my grandmother said, from kiva to kiva several times, and I've never read it. Please help me to understand. 
Help me to find it. Where it says that if we love God, we're supposed to keep it silent. And we're not to talk about it. You see, there's a song that, that I love to hear sometime. And it's a, it's a contemporary song, but it says, Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of of you, God. When is the last time that you actually prayed and said, I want more of God in my life? What happened? Where's the fire? Have we been unable to reach our ignition point? You see, in churches all across the nation, the gospel of political correctness is being preached. The gospel of doing your own thing is the norm. And some places, church is just a place for politics and social causes. In some places, the measure of a person's Christianity is in how tolerant or in, uh, in inclusive they, they are in their acceptance of other people and other ideas. But until we start preaching that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him, we will never experience the presence of the Holy Spirit in its fullness or know the zeal of the early church until those of us who are called people of God renew our commitment to Jesus Christ on a daily basis and live faithfully for Him will we not experience the power of Pentecost. Until we live by repentance and faith, we will always go through the motions of religion without truly knowing Jesus the Christ. As long as we think that Christianity is something that we do, we are missing the point. Because it's not about what we do, but about what God does in us. Being a Christian isn't just doing the right thing or believing the right doctrines. It's about knowing the right person. It's not about being a member of the church or reciting creeds. It's not just about baptism or communion. Although all of these things are important parts of our life together, it's about surrendering our lives, our bodies, our minds, our hearts to Jesus the Christ and asking Him to take up residence in us. It's about confessing our sins and turning away from it. It's about banking everything that we have on God and loving Him with our whole heart. You see, the Christian faith isn't just a feeling. It's a reality. And it's a relationship with a living Savior. To hear some people talk, you would think that the Christian life is all about being born again. But think again. Some folk act like they think that once you come to Christ, we're supposed to hang out until Jesus comes. We want to be like the disciples, just stand there gazing up into the skies just hanging out until Jesus returns if that is the way that we think we will never experience the full potential of the Holy Spirit of God as Christians we are supposed to be salt and light in a tasteless and a dark world and we need to be transforming in order to make become more like Jesus every single day and in essence, we need to be people where heaven and earth have collided in our lives and our lives are transformed and the world can see the difference that exists in us. The world can see that the power of the Holy Spirit resides in our lives. And so if we want to feel the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to reach our ignition temperature and catch on fire. Set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. I want more of you. You see, we need for heaven and earth to collide in our lives. And when it does, Pentecost happens. Transformation happens. Change happens. People begin to see the need for what exists in the church. 
Do you know why many of our churches are empty today? You might say, well, it's because of that big mouth preacher. But, but many of our churches are ex- empty today simply because the folks on the outside don't want what's on the inside. Because they're looking and they're saying, where's the stuff? Where's the stuff? Where is the stuff that we read about in the scriptures? You see, there are some people who are on the outside that are more spiritual than the we that are on the inside. But they're saying, where is the stuff? I want to leave you with this question, First Church. Where is the stuff in your life? Are you wanting, are you willing for the Holy Spirit of God to put the stuff in your life that heaven and earth can collide in your life and transform and change you. Because that's what the world is looking for. The world is looking for the church to stand up and be the church. We've been silent for too long. We need to be the church that God called into existence. We need to become the church that people can say, oh yeah, there's the stuff. And that will only happen when heaven and earth collide in our lives. Because it can happen. You see, the early church, the apostolic church, changed the culture that was around it. This was a new people of the way. But before a few hundred years, Christianity was a world religion. It was the religion of the world. The whole world accepted Christianity as the religion. It was was thriving. It was moving. It changed the culture that was around it. But as we look at it today, we've allowed the church to become changed by the society because we've forgotten that heaven and earth collided. And so I pray and ask that you would leave this place with a renewed understanding of the Holy Spirit in your life and let the Holy Spirit exercise His way in you. Let us pray together. Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. God, we thank You for this time. We pray and ask right now, God, that You would transform and that You would change our hearts. Establish us, Lord. God, is your people. God, that we would be with one voice that is we leave this place proclaiming the gospel to all the world that the world could hear and understand that we've got the stuff. We've got the stuff. We're just living it out in a miraculous and a mighty way. And God, will honor you and we'll praise you. In the name of the Christ, we do pray. And let all of God's people say, Amen. Let us stand.
and sing the song of gladness. Do you ever sing that? Do you ever pray that in your life? That God would use you to feed His lambs. That you would let God use your life to transform others. Receive this benediction. May the grace and the peace of an almighty God go with us, lead us, and guide us. That we would allow heaven and earth to collide in our lives. That the world may know that truly indeed Christ has arisen, Christ has ascended, and Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He lives and reigns in each and every one of us and that surely we have the stuff. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit of God we pray and let all of God's beautiful people say Amen. Amen.